Tommy oh, Von Voigt is back today. The doctor of rock, the priest <laughs> of all things awesome. And we are delivering the goods on Judas Priest. Um, <laughs> yes, yes, we are, man. We are a hell bent for leather right now. <laughs> yes, we are. I mean, we're going to hop right into it. These guys aren't really funny enough. Um, there's a lot of things with Judas Priest that, like a lot of other, like a, another handful of bands throughout the 80s, are surprisingly super influential. And yet, mm -hmm. like the band, I don't really see. Nobody really seems to be doing like specials on, or heavily talking about. Um, so let's uh, let, let's get let's get into it. Let's get into the formation of these guys. Let's talk about where they're from. Let's talk about why they're so unique as a band. Who makes this band up? Okay, uh, yeah, I mean their roots actually go way back to 1969, which surprises a lot of people. Because, you know, you associate Priest with the 80s. But yeah, they go back to 1969. But the original lineup contained absolutely none of the people that made up the classic lineup. So technically, there is not one single original member in Judas Priest, nor has there been in many, 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 many decades. Because <laughs> um, there, yeah, yeah, there are. Yeah, because there are pictures from these guys in like 60s, yes. early 70s. And they look like the most token late 60s early 70s band you can find oh yeah 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 i mean they you know they they were making heavy music then but you know heavy for the time um but that original lineup was just completely different dudes one of which was this guy named al atkins and he's the only one that i even bother remembering his name because the other guys they just came and went it's just like you know i I know a guy, I know a bloke that can play bass, so he's in the band. It was like one of those situations. So there was there was a there was a bit of revolving door going on. But um that band was called Judas Priest. And interestingly enough, KK Downing auditioned to be the guitar player in that band, and they passed on him and picked somebody else. Um so <laughs> It only gets so better from first, here. <laughs> it only gets better. Yeah. So that first version of Priest, um, you know, they kicked around a little bit, cut some demos, uh, had some minor interest, and then it just fizzled out. It went bust. And then KK ended up playing in a different band with some other guys, I believe, including Ian Hill, later to be of Judas Priest fame on bass. And uh, they had no singer. So Al Atkins hit them up and said, well, let's let's get together. I'll be your singer. And and he joined up and then he's like, would you guys want to use the name that I had previously been using, Judas Priest? And they're like, OK, cool. So then that became Judas Priest Mark II. And um, that version gigged for a couple of years. And then Al, now the only original actual member of the original Judas Priest, had a family that he had take care of and they were just starving they were making no money like at all like just going deep into debt so he had to leave and at that point they got rob halford and we're talking around i want to say 73 ish or so okay and, so yeah and that was halford. that was yeah that was the classic lineup was born yes yeah the legend the legendary lineup yes because from my understanding, too, uh, Judas Priest has a huge contribution also in visual aesthetics of heavy metal. Yes, but that doesn't actually come from what people assume it does. And I know then you mentioned that as soon as we start talking about Rob Halford, which you would think you would logic that out and say, oh, OK, I get it. I get where all the leather and studs and chains and all that stuff came from. That apparently was not Rob's idea. Apparently, at least so he claims, that came from K.K. Downing. That it was his idea for them to adopt the leather and studs look. And uh, this would have been in the mid-70s. So it wasn't immediately upon Rob joining. In fact, you could find footage of them playing on the old break whistle test in support of their first album, the... Uh, yeah, lackluster, shall we say, rock a roller from 1974. 
and they look like hippies and rob's got his long blonde hippie hair and like frilly stuff on and everything and like they did not look like judas priest that <laughs> all judas priest but, that you know yeah. okay yeah but but apparently kk downing suggested they adopt that look and they all just went along with it thinking it was really cool you know they were associating with more of the the biker subculture and less so much um the gay uh, subculture and uh in fact rob has said that uh that was never his thing like whips and chains and bondage and leather and all that stuff he says he considers himself and always has considered himself very very vanilla <laughs> and that whole and that whole scene was never his thing it was just a thing he did on stage because the whole band was doing it but retroactively people have made assumptions that that all must have come from rob alford and it actually didn't which i I think it's kind of fascinating. I honestly am not surprised, and I find that very funny because um, people had always said it was Rob's influence. He brought it on stage, um, but that to, it does not really surprise me because in the media during the seventies, in particular, bikers were bikers were pretty uh, heavy present. Um, and it may not even and have been in an ominous and threatening presence too. Yeah, you know there there was there was a danger. There was a, there was a menace about. I mean, you're talking about not too many years after Altamont, where the Hell's Angels were hired to security and killed one of the concert goers. Um, you yeah. know there were there were biker exploitation movies all throughout the late '60s and early '70s. So that image in people's mind in the public uh, in the public's eye was you know it was threatening. It was dangerous. It was rebellious. Yeah, really funny enough, there were a couple movies I studied in college uh, relating to 60s and 70s media where uh, government hired people in Hollywood to be making movies to talk about the dangerous lifestyle of uh, crime, uh, biker gangs. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, Altima is, uh, in case people don't know, um, the Rolling Stones basically hired uh these speed freaks known as the hell's angels yes, who, they did yep and uh funny enough i actually do have a connection with things like um the uh the laconia uh bike bike week um during the original riot my, my uncle and my mom's brother <laughs> they both went <laughs> to go see uh the bikes uh because chip was uh is huge with cars and um they snuck out like a couple of bad kids and <laughs> they knew a store they knew a store owner and they wanted to sit on top and watch the bikes and see all the whatever it was that was going on uh, i don't fully remember and the riots broke out and they were they were pretty bad um it, Back, at least back then nowadays i'm pretty sure it's not nearly as what it used to be but it used to be like people would just roll on into town there'd be people parked all the way at like lines just miles of bikers just camped out along the side of the road wow <laughs> not getting policed at all either so but luckily nowadays it's totally okay to own a Harley and a leather jacket. <laughs> and uh you're not you're less likely to uh you know to draw some negative attention your way. Yeah, it was definitely if you were going to adopt that look in the 70s, um yeah, that was a very calculated move. You knew what you were doing. You knew what kind of message that was going to send it's interesting though when you read interviews with these guys and they talk about prior to that that change they felt like they had no visual identity whatsoever because they really largely they didn't you know they felt like they they had uh excellent musicianship they were very proud of their abilities as a band they were liking the material they were coming up with they thought that they were a kick-ass band they were all really excited about but they're like we have no visual identity there's nothing to set us apart visually they understood the importance of that early on um and by making that change i mean what that brought to how influential influential that was for heavy metal in years to come 
they couldn't have possibly predicted that. But they were right in that they needed to make a change. And that was the right move to make. You know, it's easy for me to look back and say, oh, my God, of course, obviously go with that look. Yeah. Yeah, no, looking now, it's like, yeah, it definitely should. But um, yeah. So was there something that drove KK to want to um, pick a, that biker look? Well, I don't think he's ever particularly elaborated as exactly, you know, like I was watching TV one morning and there was the, you know, the light bulb moment. But I think it, it really, it, it comes down to what we were just discussing, you know, what the public perception of that look was. They knew they needed an identity. Um, you know, they knew they were, they were intent on being a very, very heavy rock band, uh, a, a metal band. It's as, you know, as heavy as metal was at the time, they were trying to be the heaviest. And uh, they wanted something edgy. They wanted something threatening. They wanted something that uh, that exuded power and and rebelliousness. And I think that you know that was the obvious choice, really. Um, and there were a lot of other uh, visual things too that uh, Judas Priest became recognizable for on stage. Yeah, there were. There's a couple of other things. Um, you know, you look back, and it's not like you you don't think, well, that's not exactly you know. Uh, you know, groundbreaking, I guess, but uh, it, it became synonymous with a loud, heavy rock and roll or a metal band. You know, the the, uh, the wall of Marshall Sacks, that was always a priest thing. Um, Rob coming out on stage, riding a Harley and shoving the microphone into the exhaust pipe. Um, you know, the flying Vs, you know, they were they were adopting all these things and all of these things eventually, like, became synonymous with heavy metal you know the, the 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 look the attitude everything like judas priest like they were just doing in hindsight you look and it's like yeah obvious that was obvious an obvious move but like it was just blowing people's minds and like fans were following suit like we got to look like that we got to do that we got to sound like that blah, 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 blah. um i don't know it's just it's just really cool you know it, when you watch an old judas priest video live footage or anything and you look at it it's like yep that's it that's the blueprint there you go they nailed it. <laughs> every single decision they made visually, every aesthetic move they made was exactly what they needed to do. And it makes perfect sense. And everyone started doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Couldn't have, uh, couldn't have done the more clear cut <clears throat> borderline nowadays, cookie cutter model for heavy metal. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so aside from that, uh, Judas Priest, they come out, um, they have a whole different look. Um, obviously, like at the beginning, they had their hippie look. Um, but yeah. what were let, let's get into the music. What were the, what were um, the jumping points where Judas Priest goes from being this heavy rock band to being this heavy metal band? So. I'd mentioned uh, the rock and roll of a record came out, I believe in September of 74. Um, and that's the one that they not too long after that, they started distancing self, themselves from it. The, you know, they didn't have the, the aesthetics in place. They had a lot of disagreements with the producer. I believe that might've been Martin Birch who had worked with Sabbath, but he disagreed with them during the entire process. He was like making decisions that, you know, artistically they were really pissed off about cutting a 10 minute song down to two minutes and making it an instrumental shit like that. Um, so it's less than two years later, early in 76, they put out Sad Wings of Destiny. And that is the album that still sounds kind of early. You know, when you listen back to it, you're like, oh, this is very, this is clearly very early Priest. But that's the one that I think they and a lot of the fan base consider to be really their proper debut. Um, there's a lot of prog influence on that, but it's really heavy prog. That's the thing. The, the early Priest records, there was there was a there were there was very very heavy stuff, fast riffing, heavy heavy blues rock, and prog influence, and that kind of mishmash kind of became their early Priest metal sound, and that really gets going in full force on Sad Wings of Destiny in '76, um, and they kind of start playing with the formula a little bit over the next few albums. And it's not really until, gosh, I want to say they really crystallized things by the time they put out the live record, 
And then by 1980, when they put out British Steel, it was like, okay, there's the sonic blueprint. That's the priest sound that we've that like going forward. That's the that's the one that became like the iconic priest sound. That's the one that's got a ton of hits on it. You know what I mean? And like going forward, they're like, okay, we know what we are. Definitely. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, now that's not to say there aren't some killer songs on on the earlier records. Oh no! You know, I think British Steel has got to be like got five six records in. Um, so there's some there's some dope stuff on like Killing Machine, which has Hellbent for Leather Leather on it, and uh, I mean that's a that's an iconic track. You know what I mean? Exactly. Yeah, I mean they've got a lot of really. To me, I mean, especially listening to the early priest stuff, there's these like funky beats and um, experimentation that I don't really hear in much other heavy metal uh, music. Um, well, that's the prog influence. And, you know, we should never forget how huge prog was in the 70s. And there was not just one flavor of prog. You know, there was Priest's version of Prague. There was Emerson, Lake, and Palmer's version of Prague. There was Genesis's version of Prague. You know, you could even consider Electric Light Orchestra to be Prague. Prague was, you know, there was Rush's version of Prague. Um, Prague was everywhere. Was people, bands were trying to experiment like crazy, um, which is one of the things that led to the punk movement. Because, you know, you had these guys that were looking at all this stuff like, this is insane. What are you even doing? Just give us three chords and the truth. Um, but Prague was just, Prague was all over the place. So you're hearing so much of that on that early priest stuff. 100%. 100%. Um, and I think for me, that's uh, what of the, the priests, uh, what of priests music that is my jam um, those are the things that really stand out for me is this whole heavy focus on writing and trying out new things. I mean, I'd say like per specifically a song that I've now bestowed onto a friend as her WWE intro song, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, deliver the goods. Um, yes. you know, there's that bend right at the beginning and they're doing the whole kill switch thing where it's going in and out, in and out, while you're hearing um, what sounds like a clap, uh, but drum beat. Um, and that's something you don't really hear like in a lot of other bands. Yeah, you know, I have, there's a lot of reasons why I have a lot of respect for Priest. Um, one of them being that they were always looking to push the envelope. They were really trying to be the best band they could be, the most cutting edge band they could be, the heaviest band they could be, the most musically adventurous band they could be. They weren't afraid. They didn't do, and this is not, I don't intend this as any shade to ACDC, but I have to bring that up as an example of ACDC found their formula very, very early on. And every single album was that. It was just a variation on that. Priest was never afraid to push, man. They were never afraid to push. Even when they found their classic sound with British Steel, they still kept pushing for better or for worse all throughout the eighties. They kept pushing. They were never afraid to push. And I have to respect that. Yeah. 100%. Um, now for, for priests as a band, uh, for people that might not know priests, um, if you were to describe the sound or the characteristics of what makes up, uh, them distinctively uh from from the rest of the mold um and what does each member contribute how is it that each member of the lineup uh stands out from the rest well i mean i you know when i think of priest i think hard driving rhythms and epic banshee whale vocals that can just descend into a menacing growl at the drop of the hat um, when you think of each member, I mean, that hard driving sound is going to be coming largely from Ian, the bass player. Um, they kind of went all over the place as far as drummers for a while. They, they had 
a bit of a revolving door on the drummer lineup until they got Dave Holland in 79 or so. Yeah, about 79. And he was with the band for about 10 years. So when you would think of the classic 80s priest sound, like the rhythm, the push is coming from Ian and Dave. Um, Glenn Tipton and KK Downing. And Glenn, Glenn Tipton, by the way, was brought in right before they recorded their first album. And that was the success, the, the suggestion of the record company who said it might fill out your sound a little bit if you had two guitars. And that was such a good move. Uh, Glenn and KK, that twin guitar attack, it's just iconic. We associate that with Priest immediately. But, you know, obviously the thing that's going to stand out more than anything else is Rob Halford. And how could it not? I mean, what a voice, what a front man. You know, he's one of the greatest, truly one of the greatest ever. And even, even in his mid-70s now, he's still hitting notes. And you're like, how are you even doing that, dude? How are you doing that? And he's doing, he's doing that wearing like, you know, 50 pounds of leather soaked in sweat. Two yeah. hour sets and he's still doing it. Yeah. Um I think yeah. it was kind of funny. Um, I heard one person once say the first time I listened to Priest, it was like listening to four other singers on an album, and I had no clue that it was one guy. One guy, one guy, and that's what's so amazing about him. Um, but yeah, really, you know, the sound of priest in any given era really depends on each of the members' contributions. And in 89, when Dave Holland left, they got Scott Travis on drums, and he was with Racer X. And he pushed them into an even heavier and faster direction, and then they put out Painkiller. You know, he's incorporating all the insane double bass stuff. Um, so that kind of changed their sound, and that was because of the drummer. So there's never been at any point in any of their important eras where there was a member of the band that was just basically, and also this guy. There's never been that with, with Priest. Well, the 80s, we kick off the 80s with 1980 with British Steel, and then we go to Point of Entry is 81. Uh, Screaming for Vengeance is 82. Uh, 84 was Defenders of the Faith. And then 86 is Turbo. 88 is Ram It Down. And then 1990 is Painkiller. Um, but I want to I wanna get to Turbo. So, all right, so from British Steel up to Defenders of the Faith, they're like, this is our sound. We know what to do. And they obviously they pushed. Priest was always adventurous, but it was, you know, you knew what to, you knew what you were going to get with a Priest record. And then Tur Turbo comes out in 86. I love Turbo, and it's an incredibly polarizing Priest record. It was supposed to be a double album called Twin Turbos that was going to be a split of really heavy stuff and really, really catchy commercial stuff. And during the recording process, they ended up deciding to just go with like the more commercially oriented stuff. They were experimenting with guitar synthesizers. There's keyboards all over it. This is around the time Iron Maiden started doing that too. Um, also with records I love. Um, but Turbo, oh my God, is that such a fun record. It's the catchiest, most enjoyable Priest record. I love it. It's probably, for me, tied with British Steel as my favorite Priest album. And I love it so much. And fans were like, what the hell is this? <laughs> so is that one that breaks the mold and all the hard uh -huh. what are you talking about what is this stuff yeah like, this like, isn't heavy enough this isn't the priest we like where's the blah, 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 blah. and they're all like we don't need no 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 parental guidance here and i'm like <laughs> yes i'm here for this <laughs> <laughs> yeah the most um, rebel against your parents song ever <laughs> Yeah. Oh, and like, this is fitting. Uh, yeah, <laughs> as it turns out, <laughs> yep. parental advisor and um, tipper goer. Yep. But then that's what that song was uh, was in response to. Um, but yeah, I love that record. And that record in 86 is when I think, if I'm being honest, they started losing the plot a little bit in terms of what their diehard fan base wanted. Now, they opened up the doors to a whole new fan base, but all the diehards that have been with them for five, 10 years, whatever, were, were like, mm, this isn't really what we want from Priest. There's harder and heavier bands that are out there doing it now. We're going to start listening to them instead. And Priest went in that kind of commercial direction. And as an interesting aside, so yeah, I mentioned that Turbo was supposed to be twin Turbos. It was going to be a double album. So in 1988, they put out Ram It Down, which contained 
reworkings of some of the stuff that had gotten cut from that ill-fated double album. Ram It Down is a terrible album. Uh, don't waste your time with it. It's absolutely horrible. It's an unbelievable <laughs> misfire. And anyone who tells you otherwise is objectively wrong and it's terrible taste in music. And you heard it here first. Um, but around that time, they you want to talk about when I mentioned how Priest was never afraid to experiment. Now, I don't know if you're aware of this. Not a lot of people are. But when they were working on the Ram It Down record, they also went to see Stock Aikman Waterman. PWL, Pete Waterman Limited. Now they, if you're not familiar with, they were the famous production company based in England that did um, Dead or Alive, Rick Astley, Kylie Minogue, all that stuff. Now I absolutely love that music so much. I am one of the few places on this planet where something like heavy metal and Stock Aikman Waterman actually meet. The other place that 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 met is Judas Priest went to them. And we're like, let's do some tracks together. They did three songs together, two originals and one cover of the stylistics uh, song, You Are Everything from the 70s. Um, I, I'm not making this up. Fully produced, fully fleshed out with drum machines, sequencers, keyboards, you know, priest guitars, Rob's epic vocals. And then management was like, you cannot possibly release these songs. This will end your career. <laughs> <laughs> so they didn't end up putting any of those three songs on the uh, Ram It Down record. But one of them, one of them, part of one of them leaked online a few years back, uh, like a like an edit of the Stylistics cover, and it's amazing. <laughs> And I these think two, now they need to do an album for it. <laughs> they, they need get to play with it. But, but like somebody, like people have these tapes, like fully mixed and mastered, sitting in their closet in their drawer somewhere in a side room. And I want to hear the rest of that stylistics cover, and I want to hear those two originals so bad, and they won't release it. <laughs> and it's like at this point, dude, there's no danger to your career. Just put that shit out, but yeah. they won't put it out. Oh, um that's upsetting <laughs> it is it's very upsetting and i'm very annoyed by it because as you know i absolutely love 80s pop and i love 80s metal so like oh my god judas priest working with like the like definition of an 80s pop music factory yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah no that is uh <laughs> i've heard that leak uh I would like to hear what else they would do, really. I mean, there's there's two original songs that they did, and no one's heard a bit of those. The only thing that leaked is a bit of the stylistics cover, and it sounds gorgeous and epic. I would love to hear what the two originals are, man. You know, working with Stock Ape and Waterman, I'm sure they're really catchy, and I'm sure I'm going to love the production, but we'll never know. We'll, we'll probably never know. No. <sighs> no, I do wish, though, that, that they would. I mean... Really, it's it's 2024. I, I don't... Judas Priest is just such a concrete fan base. I don't think if they were to release release this now, they would, they would actually have any career danger. There uh, would be zero blowback. And if, if people would be... If you're either going to like it or you're not. If you, you don't like it, you're going to be like, mm, whatever, I'm going to put Defenders of the Faith back on. I mean, at this point in their career, they are such iconic legends. Rob Halford could put out a, a recording of him singing I Want a Hippopotamus for Christmas in the mid-80s, and it's not going to damage their career. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it would sell if he did that. It probably Judas would. Priest Christmas songs. <laughs> right? So, I don't know. But, like, so they, they did that, and they and said they, they put out Ram It Down without that material, and they tried to get back to their heavier roots. I think it's a trash record. And then Dave Holland left. And they got Scott Travis on drums from Race Rex. And then in 1990, they do the Painkiller record. Now, here's a hot take for me, and I know a lot of the fan base is not going to agree with me. I kind of don't like the Painkiller record. I don't really care for the title track. I don't really care for the record. I feel like at that point, Priest was no longer leading the charge, and they were trying to sound like the bands they influenced. Now, this is a risk that a lot of bands run when they have a very long career and they're legendary and influential is eventually you stop being influential 
And now you start being influenced by your influences. We see that happen with the Ramones when they put out Too Tough to Die. It, it happens to a lot of bands. And this, to me, is the clear point in time where they were no longer just lost and floundering. At this point, they kind of were like, hmm. I guess this is what heavy bands are doing now, so now we need to do this. A lot of Judas Priest fans are going to disagree with me on this, and you might even get some people commenting on the fact that I just said that. It's just my opinion, though. Uh. You do. You do. The contractual agreement is definitely a big part of it. Also, you know, in, until very recently, when the, people finally are all seemingly admitting out loud that the music industry just, just does not seem to exist. Um, but for the longest time you had like, for example, they say a band like Priest, you know, after they do Painkiller, then Rob Halford leaves and does some solo projects and they get, uh, Ripper Owens who had sang in a Priest tribute band. And that was the, the inspiration behind that movie Rockstar. And they do two records with Ripper Owens and they're very much influenced by what was going on in heavy music in the nineties and they're terrible albums. I don't like them at all. And then they get Rob Halford back in I think 2004 and, uh, and the, the magic was gone. The magic was gone. But like, you know, those guys, I don't think they could have at that point in time said, well, we're just going to tour as a legacy act and we're just going to tour doing the hits. Like, no, we're back together. We're going to tour. We're going to put out new albums. We're going to tour for the albums. Boom, boom, boom. Just like we always did. But the magic was gone. Um, but had let's say they had gotten Halford back and they're like, let's just do it. Let's just tour on the hits, the 70s and the 80s stuff and just do this for the next 20, 30 years until we can't sing and play anymore. Well, then they would have been basically dogged by accusations. You guys are a legacy act. You don't do new music anymore. So it was a lose-lose situation for them. They had to, at that, at least at that point in time, well, let's carry on like we did before. Let's put out an album tour, put an album tour. Iron Maiden did the same thing. They've been doing it for ever since they got Bruce Dickinson back. The magic is not there anymore, but what was their other choice? You know, yeah. admit that we don't have the magic anymore. Yeah. <laughs> no, we're not going to do albums anymore because we don't know how to make good ones. Like, that's insane. No one's going to say that. <laughs> no, definitely not. Uh, no, I get, I get that. And I get the, I mean, I can relate to some degree on the, um, like, sometimes people just kind of reach a point when you're just at work. Uh, yeah. Having worked at one point for uh, a, a body that was, they just sort it just sort of reached this point where it's just like, all right, I'm just here, I'm at work, and I don't really care about what I'm doing anymore. Right. Right. Yeah. I hate to use the term phone it in, but workmanlike would be a better description. Yeah. You, you know, sometimes you get albums. Hours. Yeah. Yeah. You get an album from a band that could be described as workmanlike. Like they, yep, this is what we need to do. Okay. Got to write songs like this is the heart into it uh are they trying too hard to chase current trends in production eh, you know what i mean it it's it's a no-win situation and a lot of these legacy bands fall into that at some point in their career and which when that happens is you know different from one to the next but you know uh, to a degree i think it might be a little bit inevitable but it doesn't take away from all the incredible music they put out and how important they are and i i love the fact that priest is still out there they're still out there. They put still out an album it. recently. They just put out a new album. Yes. Yeah. And and the fans were really pleased with it. I didn't love it. Um, but I could see why a lot of people might dig it. Uh, it's certainly better than some of the previous uh, later era albums they'd done. It's, just, it's not my favorite thing. But I love the fact that they're at least trying. And they're still delivering the goods. Exactly. I mean, they're still live. They're still kicking ass. They're still taking names. Um, yep. I think too, there's also an expectation from a number of people after a while that they're going to, that somebody, that each album is going to be like the next groundbreaking or the next all reinventing, <clears throat> uh, album that came out, you know, during the early years of the band. Uh, cause I still, yeah. cause I, cause I, I mean, yeah, early groups still like right. the things that they're putting out and even though it's not like the heaviest most groundbreaking thing it's still they still make there's still bands that make good albums new albums they are it's it's a bit of a no-win situation though because when when you're into a band that's now a legacy band that, that's that's still producing music you know they've got this iconic body of work from decades past 
that has a different sonic signature and they're younger and more energetic and the vocals sound, you know, youthful and higher pitched and all this stuff. And, and as these guys get older and they don't have that same fire and they're not struggling and not inspired by their struggle. And it's just never going to sound quite the same. And when you love Judas Priest because of stuff like British Steel or Turbo, and then they put out a new album just this year and it's like, well, it's never going to sound like that. And it can't sound like that, but that's really in my heart what I want it to sound like. And I have unreasonable and unrealistic expectations but it prevents me from enjoying it as much as I enjoy the older music. And there's really no way that the band could do anything about that. There's nothing that you can't, if you're going to be a reasonable, rational, rational person, you can't expect them to put out an album that sounds like it came out in 1986, but yet that's still what the heart wants, at least when talking about from my point of view. So oh, it, it kind of, it, it colors the experience for me. And, you know, and, and, you know, lots of bands that, that, have experienced that like night ranger will still put out albums you know acdc still puts out records like all these bands you know sabbath put out that that record 13 with the uh with ozzy back on vocals and it's like i listen to it and i'm like meh you know like what do you, what do i want from them well i didn't want that but that's what they're capable of because you know they're old guys now and they're, they're not the same people that they were in the 70s yeah. So I, I approach a lot of those with unreasonable expectations. And I know, I, and I'm aware of that. I'm, it's not like I'm subconsciously doing it. I'm consciously aware that I come out that these, these albums with, with this bias and it, it still colors the experience for me. And there's just nothing I can do to shake that. You know, you had a decade that followed uh, where, you know, the benchmark, the gold standard was if your lead singer can do shit like Halford could do. I mean, that's, you want to talk about influential, my God, <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, Halford influenced metal vocalists in the way that Eddie Van Halen influenced metal guitar players, if we're being frank. Yeah. Yeah. He's to me, he's kind of like the Robert Plant of heavy metal. You know, he just does this really wild highs and lows and fluctuations. Um, and I think that's, that's a really neat thing because he does something that, most vocalists just can't simply do they physically can't do it's not something that's normal for a male singer to be able to do he was very fortunate and so were all of us <laughs> yeah we we still are we still are fortunate yes um so socially what were some of the responses on uh rob um coming out at the time because this is 80s this is when aids came out um there were a lot of cultural changes too yes um so rob did not come out until 1998 did it without planning to do so at all it was an mtv news interview that he was doing and then just out of nowhere in the interview and he's like well i should think it's been obvious that i've been a gay man all my life and then every the world just lost its freaking collective mind and then you see everyone like trying to like backpedal and be like oh we yeah we always it was uh, it's obvious it's always been obvious like no you guys had no idea <laughs> the heavy metal community had no idea and i find that absolutely hilarious but they're all trying to like play this revisionist history game where it's like oh yeah we you know behind the scenes we all knew like i i even remember, like twisted sister giving interviews where they talk about when they opened for priest in like 79 and uh saying that like rob had like his people go over and like uh hit on d for him or something like that um and then i'm like yeah we all knew rob was like that but like you know it was all you know it was like one of the best kept secrets in heavy metal like no nobody knew if you ever watched that documentary heavy metal parking lot which was done in 1986 on the turbo tour which was just people with video cameras interviewing people in the parking lot at a judas priest concert with doc and opening and they're talking about like what a manly man Rob Halford is. And he's like, you know, like this, you know, like, like the definition of macho. And they're like talking to some girls and they're like, what would you do if you saw Rob Halford right now? One of them was like, I would jump his bones immediately. Um, like nobody knew, absolutely nobody knew. And they're lying if they said they knew that that blew everybody's minds. And then in hindsight, they're like, oh yeah, I guess, yes, I guess it was obvious. No, nobody knew. Um, <laughs> And here's the thing about that. I 
I have uh, no doubt why Rob waited so long. And that is because the heavy metal community likes to pride itself on being this all-inclusive thing. But the reality is it tends to not be. There are a lot of bigoted, closed-minded, let's just call it for what it is, bully types that have gravitated towards heavy metal over the years. I'm and angry and I'm going to take my anger out on you. Yes, it's it's a sad and unfortunate thing, but it is the truth. And Rob probably felt that he would not have been accepted by his fan base. And I cannot imagine what that must have been like for him to wrestle with, feeling like he could not be his true self without risking his career and alienating the fans that loved his music and his art. Um, and that must have been awful. And I, I imagine he must have felt like the weight of the entire world was lifted off his shoulders when he said that in that interview in 1998. Now, in, in today's day and age, everyone is accepting of Rob. And anyone who is not accepting of Rob can go fuck himself immediately. Uh, I have no time or patience for that kind of shit. Um, but I don't think it was always going to be that way for him, which is really unfortunate and really sad. Yeah. Um, do you think that was a landmark in changing some of the attitude in rock and roll? And I think it absolutely was. It absolutely was. It, I mean, that it had to have. How could it not? Because um, you had this this man's man band, this dude rock band, this dude metal band, like, fucking priest, bro. Yeah, uh, you, you, you know, the, the lead singer is gay. What? Like, <laughs> how yeah. could that not have, how could that have not helped change attitudes for the better? I can only hope it would have. Yeah. So, to wrap this up, uh, you got a, uh... Got anything to say for future generations about the priest? Yes. Yes, I do. And it's very poignant and it's very important. And that is Turbo is the best priest album. There, I said it. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Tommy. Thank you again.